Okay, we are live. Are you ready to get nuts, Richard? Ready. Okay. On today's episode of Playing Small is Cancelled, we have a very exclusive treat. He's an author, a dynamic transformational speaker, CEO, and father of three girls, Big Facts. As the CEO of the number one ultra wealthy investors club, Family Office Club, he leads a network of over 7,500 investors and hosts 16 in-person events each year. And he runs the most listened to podcast on family offices and the most watched YouTube channel in the space. No big deal. Over the last 17 years, his company has spent 25 million hosting 300 plus live events. And his total following across all social media surpasses 15 million, just to name a few. He also owns and operates billionaires.com where he's interviewing a hundred billionaires to create the number one resource on their scaling strategies and mindset. Please welcome the brilliant, creative, insightful, and handsome, the trailblazer, Richard C. Wilson. How you doing, Richard? Thanks, Craig. Great. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm very excited for the conversation. I know we have some mutual friends who were kind of chopping it up before we hopped on, and uh, this is going to be so valuable. For our listeners, for our community, in case you weren't familiar, my best suggestion is do a deep dive, play catch up, check out all the things he's got going on. What I think is most valuable today is we just dive right in. But before we do, I have a little icebreaker for you. Are you ready for me? Go for it. For you personally, how important is it for you to be connected to your mission? I mean, um, part of what being ultra wealthy means for most people is freedom. But what many realize is that when you look at the hierarchy of needs, having your health is the most important thing. So for me, our mission is that it's not just about being ultra wealthy, it's about being ultra healthy and having that fuel the growth of your wealth and your energy, et cetera. So um, that's a daily kind of hourly thing. I try to keep my whole family online with that that mission. So super important. I love it. And uh, I had a feeling it was, and I know what it feels like to not be connected before I reinvented myself and so forth. And when you're connected to what you're doing and it means something to you, it's very meaningful. It just makes it so much so much better way of life. Right. And and interestingly enough, it tends to lead to more money too, because you're doing it from the right consciousness. Right. For sure. I find that like a lot of times, um, bringing up being ultra healthy, like what I'm doing is just a way to connect with clients another level. They don't really expect to be talking about that at an investment club event. No one else really talks about that. It seems in the space, it's all about portfolio management and what hedge fund you want to go into or what direct investment they're doing. And so um, I think you're totally right. It, it attracts people that think like you and have the same priorities with you when you're more genuine and authentic instead of trying to look like a commoditized robot and saying everything that everybody else is saying, you know? Yes. Amen. Uh, this is great. So many places we could take this. For people that might just be introduced to you for the first time, that might not know, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs and inspiring entrepreneurs in our community. What exactly is a family office and, and how does that particular industry operate? Sure. Uh, a family office is really just a investment solution for winners in the game of capitalism, right? Like so if you run or sell a business and you're making half a million a year, a million a year or much more, or if you sell a business and you're worth, you know, th- five, seven, 10 million, tens of millions or a hundred million plus, you probably need different solutions. You for sure need different solutions and you think differently than those that are worth a hundred thousand dollars. And so the whole point of the family office space is that if you make a small mistake and you're worth a hundred thousand dollars, that mistake might cost you 500 bucks. If you make a small mistake, quote unquote, and you're worth 20 million or a hundred million, that mistake could cost you $200,000 or $50,000. You could have then hired a full-time person just to make sure you updated your LLCs, got your quarterly tax payments in, paid different counties and, and other groups that send you notices in the mail every two days when you've got 50 LLCs and just stay on top of all the minutia and help you play a good defense so you as an entrepreneur can focus on playing offense and make less $50,000 mistakes along the way and do things a bit more holistically. You know, the ultimate goal for every entrepreneur is to figure out what they're amazing at, what they're passionate about and spend most of their time doing that. And so you just need a team around you to pull that off. And that, that's basically what a family office is for. Beautifully said. It's funny because so many entrepreneurs, they want to be entrepreneurs. They want freedom, the money, the lifestyle, but they have trouble focusing and narrowing down on on what exactly it is that they want to do. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that a lot, Um, especially for people who are about to sell their first company or just did. 
many times I'll have someone who made their money in auto dealerships or dental practices and they sell and they say, I don't know what to do with my time. I don't know what to do with myself. Maybe I'll open a bar. Maybe I'll start a restaurant. Maybe I'll invest in a whole bunch of random industries. And okay, there's a place for diversification in everyone's portfolio typically, but they don't realize that after 10,000 hours running an auto business or being a dental practice owner, that you could invest in that same space and you don't have to start your own dentist practice again. You could go and be the, the chairman of the board of a practice. You could be a advisor. You could be a board member. You could just be a passive investor and know how to do the due diligence better. So this comes up all the time with clients that I talk to. Yeah, love it. So insightful. In regards to family offices, is there typically like a, like a roadmap or an industry trend where they allocate their capital or each office is run a little bit differently with their own creativity? You know, many times in this industry, people use this excuse to not be very helpful when answering such a question. They say, oh, if you know one family office, you know one, they're all different, but it's not really true. Uh, when you're around for a long time, it's more like looking at the jungle and say, here's a genus and species of an animal. And with this type of a family that has this type of first generation wealth, they typically have these traits. And there's different variations within that box, but that's the real answer. And so the most generic answer I can give that could be helpful would be that most families like to have some money in the public markets. Most families like to have some money in cash flowing real estate that are hard assets, beats inflation, plays offense and defense for you while the public markets are mostly playing defense. And then most families have a third bucket where they play offense. And that's usually in just one or two niches. Um, so the family might made the money in manufacturing. Maybe they believe in the future of stem cells. They might play offense in those two niches, invest in four different real estate food groups in five different states they like, and then tell their wealth advisor, hey, we love you know, Tesla and Costco and Amazon. Otherwise, just diversify me and make sure I don't lose all my money. And that's kind of like a... The percentages will be different, but that's kind of like the template. Those three buckets are usually at play with the family office. I love it. And each like each family has different common traits, I would imagine, that you partner with. Right. So a fourth generation family where the first generation was worth two to three hundred million and they made their initial money in manufacturing. Typically, by fourth generation, they're just playing a diversification defense game. They typically have no offense game. They may invest in real estate, but mostly through fund managers, um, where first gen families where the father or mother is still in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and the second gen is being groomed to take over, they have a lot of things in common as well. They may still own many businesses within their niche. The next generation may have found a family member or two still interested in that niche. So the percentage that people are investing in their offensive game and the percentage um, where people are just playing pure defense changes greatly based on like the generation that you're dealing with with the wealth makes perfect sense what do you personally love the most about what you do well i love the most is that running our investor club is like a perpetual learning machine right like every time like next week's event we have 120 speakers on stage in three days there's no way that you listen to 120 people and you don't find 10 or 20 super insightful for exactly what you are curious about and the cool thing is that I get to cheat a little bit after coming to 300 of my own events. I don't want to get bored and I get bored very easily. So I asked all the questions I'm curious about on the discussion panels. I script every single discussion panel question. So if somebody came to 50 of our events, they would continue to be unique and dialed in to, you know, what I'm selfishly curious about. And I, I feel like that's a good litmus test for making sure it's not like, the same event over and over again and, and boring people. So that's that's the part I enjoy the most, just the mental growth of it all. I love that that's so important to you to make sure that everybody, because I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of people that go to a lot of them because you have a community and so right. forth, but you keep the experience different and refreshing each time. Right, yeah, I think importantly, the um, when I started this business, I had less money in my bank account than I had due for rent that month uh, living goodness. in Harvard Square. And everything I built with my business was from studying the ultra wealthy, interviewing them, reading books, sucking up information, and then just speed of implementation and just execution and finding the next good mentor. Um, and that I hope is inspiring to people that don't have money and they're listening to this and they're trying to raise capital for their AR startup or their real estate development firm. You know, it's like Mark Cuban says, you don't need all the money in the world. You don't even need all the network um, that you think people need to be successful. 
You just need to focus on a niche and out learn everybody else in that niche. And you'll have an amazing advantage over everybody else. That's beautiful. We would drop the mic or we're just getting warmed up. And thank you for sharing that. I love the vulnerability. And that is so encouraging for everybody. There's no secret sauce. Some people think you just have to have connections, but right. learn and be able to, to focus and put your energy there. You're interviewing a ton of billionaires. You're kind of obsessed with that. So am I. Yeah. I love that about you. What are some cool or interesting billionaire strategies for success that you've noticed or, or maybe even modeled? Sure. Um, some have just been hammered so hard over so many books. Um, for example, I just read a book from Ted Turner, just read two books through Oprah, I just read one of Richard Branson's books all over the last week. And just so many dozens of the books talk about how it's not just an aspect that billionaires do things differently. It's like core to their DNA that if everyone says this is the way it's done, they automatically think that's not the way we do it. Or if someone says they're crazy or they don't get it, that's not how this industry works or that will never work. They actually know they're on the right path and they lean forward where common sense might tell you, um, you know, like tomorrow I'm interviewing Robert Cialdini um, for my podcast and YouTube and, and common sense would tell you, you should full follow social proof. Oh, what does everyone else do? Oh, it's safe to eat those blueberries on the mountain. Okay, I'll eat the blueberries. But they know they will never scale above average if they do what the average person does. And that's just so core to their DNA. People know that but I don't think they apply it every day to everything they're doing. So that's just one thing I wanted to, to emphasize. And then I think the other thing is just making sure that you're strategic in the assets you're acquiring um, so you can scale massively. You know, that you have to keep things relatively simple to scale sometimes, but you also have to be very strategic and long-term minded. And sometimes the plans that they are working on don't unfold for, you know, five or 10 years. Yeah, I love that because those are trendsetters, right? Not necessarily right. followers. If you hear something that's supposed to be done a certain way, there's a, a, a different breed of people that think automatically, how do I think outside that box? How can we do things a little bit differently? That's right. not necessarily an indication of how it has to be done. And those right. are the type of cats that typically change the world. Right, yeah, for sure. And I think that, um, one thing I've noticed after reading, I've read 105 books authored by billionaires now out of the 240 that, that exist. And just now, having read 100 of them, not like an AI summary, but actually reading them or listening to the full audible, just now I find myself having my thoughts kind of filtered by that general consensus, that way that they typically talk, the way they typically think. Uh, in terms of expectations from my team, you know, our plans for the future. Um, and it's kind of like the five people you hang out with most type thing, right? So I think that um, there's a subconscious level that all this stuff impacts you at if you focus on something enough. Beautiful. I love it. In regards to investors or someone that's raising money and they're creating a pitch deck, right. what are some common pitch deck mistakes maybe that you've noticed? Sure. Um, some of the biggest ones is that they'll have a 45 page pitch deck. No one's going to read that. You could put the word Mickey Mouse in the middle of it, ask your spouse and your business partner to see if they notice anything wrong and they won't catch it. Um, and so most of the time they think the pitch deck is the Holy grail and you need to stuff everything in there. Instead, I would make it 12 to 19 pages long. I would for sure have a one pager to go with your pitch deck, not just a pitch deck have a one liner that hits people between the eyes and they can't help but want to learn more and be very excited to hear more so you don't look like everybody else in your industry. And then make sure you have a video from you as the founder that's three to four minutes maximum that says something compelling um, to show off your expertise and why they should take a meeting with you and have that on your one page or your website and your pitch deck. I think that those are all things that cost absolutely nothing. We're not telling people to go out and spend $100,000 on design. We're just saying like, do these basics because almost nobody does those three or four things I just mentioned. So funny. And so longer doesn't necessarily mean better. In fact, maybe quite the opposite. Less might be more. Yeah, means worse, right? Like uh, one of my mentors was Evan Pagan and he turned me on to Jay Abraham and Gary Halbert and a bunch of copywriting experts. And there's a saying in the copywriting industry, I think John Carlton, is one who brought it up the most. And he says that 
I'm sorry I wrote so much. I didn't have more time to make it concise. In other words, it's just basically not choosing what's most important to tell somebody 75 pages of stuff about what you're doing. You know, everybody's busy. Your best investors have the least amount of time to get what you're doing. So if you don't make it hyper clear, you're dead. If your pitch deck says Wilson Capital, copyright 2024, and then the next page is disclosures and the next page is table of contents, they got to get four pages in if you even know they know anything about what you're doing, right? The, the brand of your company should tell people what you do and why they should work with you. Your one liner, front of page or your pitch deck. Your video, page two. You know, and that's completely different. That could change your whole life just making those changes if you're raising capital right now. That right, that there, right there is an eight figure nugget. And, <laughs> and it's so true because we get pitched a lot too to be on advisors, the way we built our personal brand and so forth. And often right. it takes so many pages to just even see what's going on here. Right. And our, you know, we, I see this very humbly, like, especially you, right. you don't have that much extra time. So right. you can kind of get to the point often and, you know, go deep right oh, away. Yeah, yeah no, that's great advice. Yeah, we have um, hundreds and hundreds of investors on stage per year. Like just in the next two months, we have 250 speakers on stage at our next two events. And so doing this for 17 years now, I don't know how many times I've heard that you have like four seconds, half a sentence, the first line of your email, the subject line of your email, Otherwise, you're gone because, you know, people start their days and they have 175 to 500 plus emails in their inbox. They're trying to figure out like I, I can type like the wind and on a productive day, I'm getting 65 to 85 emails sent. Uh, so you can imagine someone who's much wealthier than me, 15, 20 years older than me. How many emails are they sending a day? 20, 30? Right. So you're dead if you don't stand out night and day from everything else in their inbox. Yeah, this is awesome. You mentioned your events uh, strictly off the cuff. You have another event coming up pretty soon in Brooklyn. Is that right? Right. Yep. October 3rd to 5th. We're going to have um, about 500 people at that event. And uh, the founder of Barefoot Wines, um, they're going to be there. They started from zero and got it $500 million as one of the top wine brands in the United States. Um, so we're going to do a fireside chat with them and have discussion panels with pro athletes and angel investors and tech investors and family offices, et cetera. I imagine it's probably sold out, but is there any way that anyone's listening or that might see this? Is there an ability for them to go or who is that event for? Yeah, um, it's actually not sold out because we try to make it very exclusive. We used to sell event tickets. We used to do like a um very low entry subscription model now we have more of a just a membership model we've found after running some conferences with 1500 people at them that quality is super important versus quantity of people yes. um and basically if you know five or six thousand dollars looks very expensive to someone for an annual membership then that's not the type of person that the family offices typically going to want to engage with because they want someone who has a real business behind them that has some progress already has success etc they'll sometimes seed ideas from nothing uh and there's a place for that but uh we try to make it relatively exclusive and um familyoffices.com is our website it's got all the event details and and whatnot i love it okay uh pivoting for a second for investors out there and we have a lot in our community what is a way i imagine you know better than anybody for in for investors to increase their deal flow yeah great question um many investors don't realize how bad their deal flow is uh one of my friends sold their business for 30 million dollars and he said oh it's amazing i've probably seen 30 deals over the last four years and many people uh like a jeff hoffman mark cuban you know friends of ours is uh you know, they'll, they'll see 30 deals per hour and a well-connected family office will see, you know, at least 30 deals a week, right? And so the goal is not to see thousands and thousands of deals. The goal is to see deals which are amazing for your family office. And so typically that means you select what real estate food groups you like and what states you put it out there that you're on the hunt to find those. So you get deals that are exactly what you're looking for in your strike zone. But then also the bigger strategy that almost nobody does is they figure out the best family offices, figure out where they're going to play offense. Like, let's say they made their money in dry cleaners um, and they sold their, their business and they had three 
or five or 10 dry cleaning locations. Well, now they should maximize to play offense, maybe their deal flow in the dry cleaning space. So how do they do that? They could speak at the dry cleaner owners association, which costs 10,000 a year to be a member or whatever. They could um, more importantly, maybe create a database and say, we want to invest in dry cleaners in the state of Texas and the state of Arizona. So let's create a database of 400 dry cleaners in those states, create a one line email, reach out to them and get people who never thought about selling yet. And you are who they want to be when they grow up. So they will reply to your email while they ignore private equity all day long. And you can say, hey, I built my dry cleaning business to four locations. I sold. I'd love to invest in your business or sit on your board or or maybe even buy your business or partner. You know, do you mind jumping on a phone call for five minutes? And that's completely different than a private equity offer. And then you'll originate deals that no one else has seen and is not shopped by a banker. Unbelievable. I imagine at this stage you've really gotten comfortable and love to use the word no. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. But um, getting better and better at that i think is a a challenge for every founder on planet earth because every year you have more llc's more k1's more opportunities coming at you and the quality of those opportunities gets better and the problem with that is that you are screening for what you said no to last year it no longer works for this year because there's more coming at you at higher quality so every year i feel like you have to come up with more strategies on saying no more ways of saying no and tightening up communication so you don't spend your whole life on you know one-on-one -on -one zoom calls and phone calls you know yes yeah. amen this is so good um for people that are looking to raise money um maybe they don't even know where to begin on their quest what's a good maybe first step to begin you, your journey to start raising capital sure um one thing is to focus and make sure you're doing something that's very high conviction. That when people look at it, they get high conviction and that you yourself are sold on it. No one's going to take something more seriously than you take it yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're emailing people with a Gmail address and you're kind of doing some daisy chain, raising capital for five things like this billion dollar resort in the Caribbean on an island and some foreign oil and gas deal with someone you've never met, like that's just LinkedIn amateur hour 101 and you're dead. <laughs> Uh, if you've never raised capital, don't go out there and try to raise a billion dollars. Michael Jordan couldn't jump from basketball straight into Major League Baseball, and he's the most talented, hardworking guy that ever lived, right? So don't think you're going to go from not raising capital, like, oh, yeah, just close this $400 million deal. Yeah, more power to you if you're the first person in 17 years I've ever met that can pull that off, but you're not going to, as is candidly the, the reality in my experience. Um, and then the other thing is that I spent time to record 17 free videos on my YouTube channel. It's under uh, Cinta Millionaire Strategies on YouTube, under playlists. There's something called the $100 million Rainmaker series. And there's 17 videos there for free that are four to seven minutes long each. And there's dozens and dozens of strategies to raise capital uh, within that um, playlist. So good. So helpful. And we'll put all that up in the show notes. From your experience, what are some good time management priorities for investors based upon what you've studied and so forth? Yeah, I'm glad that you um, you asked it that way, because especially for investors, but I think for everyone, um, only communicating with people via phone call and Zoom instead of emails, I think is a strategy for a decade or two ago. Um, I feel like the world's moving more towards uh, audio messages, and we use this extensively. So um, I save hundreds of hours with what I'm about to tell you. So I get emails, people say, hey, I want to jump on a call, I'll tell you about this idea. And then I say, okay, great. Well, um, you know, we're chatting here on email or LinkedIn already. Can you shoot over a teaser on the idea? Because, you know, if it's a mobile up, mobile app startup from Pakistan, you know, it's just not what I'm focused on. So I just need to know kind of what you want to talk about. And what I found is that if the person can't write it clearly and concisely, then they're not thinking clearly. Um, they don't have a clear idea. They kind of want to brainstorm and shoot from the hip and waste your time. So that saves me a ton of time. Then when people do tell me something that could result in a phone call or a conversation, I say, oh, can you write out an agenda of what five or seven things you want to cover? They'll write it out. And then I will reply to their agenda items and say, yes, yes, no, no, we would never do that. We always do that. Uh, and yeah, let's jump on a phone call because number three sounds like something that really is meaty and we need to actually talk it through. And um, the other points, we're all in agreement already, so we don't need to spend verbal time walking through each point. 
Um, and that there saves me a ton of time because also the topic could be great, but then once I see the bullet points, I'm like, nope, sorry, we can't help you, but my team member can, or my friend John can, or, you know, and then it, it just leads to a referral without me having to get on the phone. That's another thing that saves me a ton of time. And then the third thing is that while other people set up phone calls and Zooms, I let people know that I do almost everything via audio message. So we can talk on text message or WhatsApp uh, audio. And by the time that my competition has set up a Zoom call or sent someone a Calendly link and then someone shows up three minutes late and my mic doesn't work like today, it didn't, that's why I got to hold my, my new iPhone here and it's shaking the whole video. You know, by the time that the competition has set up that Zoom call for six days from now, I've already traded three audio messages with the person and we already solved the issue, moved it forward. And and there's no, hey, how's the weather there? Hey, where are you based? It's just kind of like, hey, can you help me with this? Oh yeah, that's what we do. Let me connect you to this person, done. And it's just lightning fast compared to Zoom and phone calls, which are just, you know, death to my soul if I let it take over my life, you know? I love the way you speak, brother. Uh, and I understand completely. <laughs> and, you know, I reinvent myself for more to, to doing what I'm doing now. And in the beginning, it was a lot of Zooms, a lot of coffee chat, virtual coffee chats. And there yeah. was because when you get someone that's aligned, you can get something done, but it's very time yeah. consuming. And I never articulated it like this, but the way you just said it struck a chord, death to the soul. Like you look at <laughs> your schedule and just zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Painful. The, the other thing is um, I have all of my Zooms and calls on Wednesdays. And I learned this from Dan Sullivan, who's one of my mentors. And I do uh, my focus day. My focus days are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and my my time for calls and podcasts, et cetera, like this are on Wednesdays. And that way, my Wednesday might be a bit messier. I, st I still have meetings with people. I still get on Zooms with people. But um, I want to reserve that for, you know, a ultra wealthy family we're working with or a key partner or an exciting show to be on like yours um and handle other things very quickly via audio message and and other things like using my team yeah well said time well spent how important is it for you to have mentor I, mean, I know that you have a lot of indirect mentors books that you read but actual mentors in your life uh it's been very important at the beginning it was um brian tracy and jeffrey gittimer studying their materials and then meeting them in person then it was evan pagan meeting him in person and getting mentored through his group coaching and a little bit one-on-one. -on -one. Um, then it was um, Dan Sullivan and strategic coach. Um, now what I found is that instead of going to other coaching programs, I just try to have the most amazing speakers in the world and most amazing people speaking at my own events. Uh, so I'm putting my energy into making our events more and more exciting and, and um, you know, growth mindset oriented. And then the other thing is that, for now, I feel like reading 240 books authored by billionaires and then interviewing the 100 billionaires, uh, there'll be a few mentors that come from that process. But for the current time, they're just a nonstop feed of kind of billionaire insights from the books I'm reading, the audible books and everything from the billionaires. So super critical. Love it. So good. Um, before we land the plane, I wanted to ask you, with the business that you run and also your desire for your family and adventure, how do you, I never liked this word balance, but how do you integrate all of that? No problem. Yeah. Um, so I don't really worry about the semantics of like, you know, work-life balance, et cetera. I just have some, some rules that try to abide by. So um, on the weekends, I only work before my family's awake. So I'll work from like 4 a.m. till 7 a.m or 7.30 a.m. when we're traveling, like we're going to Bali in a couple of weeks for, for 12 days and with my kids and my wife. And so when I'm there, I'll get up between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. and then I'll work until they're done eating their breakfast, say 8, 8.30 a.m. And then we're off in Bali for the day and I got four, four and a half hours of work done and a great excuse not to jump on tons of Zooms. Like, oh, sorry, I'm overseas in Bali. You know, let's just handle this via audio message. And then, you know, I can get tons done with great focus with no meetings going on really well there. Um, I also don't do any client dinners. I'll have a client breakfast or lunch or a coffee meeting. Um, but the whole year I do zero client dinners because that's time with my kids. Um, and I'm an early riser. My brain's not very useful by 4 p.m., 5 p.m. So um th that's the way i kind of keep things balanced is to have those time restrictions around not being a workaholic and then i go on a lot of um 
you know, long walks and runs and workouts here in Hawaii. And when I'm doing like a hour and a half hike up a local summit here, uh, I do a couple times a week, I'll listen to the billionaire books so I can shoot off an audio message to my team, stream billionaire ideas into my brain and get the exercise knocked out all at once. So it, it feels like double productive versus just going to a gym with, with pounding hip hop music and then I'm not getting the billionaire ideas, you know? So those are some of the things I keep in mind, you know? A hundred percent. And I'm, I'm training right now for the New York City Marathon, which is in five weeks. And Oh, um, nice. Yeah. Look, my long runs, like I had one this morning. Yeah. Trying to do my best connecting or a right. book, audio book or a podcast or something where I'm just, I'm getting downloads. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing. That makes sense. Sometimes I, I try to balance it, right? Like sometimes you need that music to survive True. a brutal workout, right? Like when I'm doing a, a Murph or when I'm doing something like brutal, then I definitely need music, right? Uh, so maybe sometimes the first half of a 10K or the first half of a half marathon, I'll do some audiobook stuff. And then when I'm really feeling like, okay, you know, and I put on the music and yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I'm still, uh, I'm not like a business robot, right? It's not like all I do is, you know, uh, try to work on business. You got to keep life fun. And that's why uh, I live in Hawaii, right? It's kind of like it's ranked the number one healthiest to the number one happiest state in the United States. And that's the gift I want to give to myself and my family for our success. I could buy 20 Lamborghinis instead of living in Hawaii, but that's just not how I define success, you know? Beautifully said. I'm just curious, when you wake up that early, especially when you want to get a ton of work done before your family is done with breakfast, what time yeah. do you sleep? Yeah, great question, because that's the real secret, right? Anyone can set their alarm early, but then you feel horrible if you don't go to bed in time, right? So uh, we're usually getting the kids down at 8 p.m. sharp, and then I'm trying to start my bedtime routine like 9, 9.15. Uh, sometimes I end up going to bed at 9.30 or 10 or even 10.30, but um, I don't operate too well with less than six hours of sleep, and I've seen all the research that you know less than seven is – pretty much lowering your IQ a little bit and making you non-optimal for health. And so uh, trying to get seven hours of sleep. Um, so to get up, you know, at the 4.30, I need to be getting to bed at 9.30 type thing. So sometimes you'll get maybe six, but you try to get seven. Yeah, yeah. Recently I got four and figured I would just take a nap and I did take a nap and I, I just regretted it. You know, uh, it's just not enough for me typically. So unless it's an airplane flight that I have to catch, I really try to avoid you know, four and a half or four hours of sleep because I know it's just going to equal pain, you know. <laughs> I love it, brother. This is awesome. Uh, can we do some more things before we land sure. the plane? Maybe a little rapid fire, one or two word answers. We'll have a little fun. Are you ready for sure. it? Sure. Let's go for it. Okay. Your favorite movie? Hmm. Uh, Interstellar. It's a good one. Christopher Nolan. Great one. Yeah. Uh, favorite workout? Murph. For those that might not be familiar, um, traditionally you're supposed to do it with the 25 pound vest. Almost nobody does. Uh, the Murph workout is run one mile and then you do a hundred pull-ups, you do 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and then you run a mile to make it more practical. You can break that up into sets of 20. So you just do five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats. You do that 20 times that gets you all those numbers in the middle. Then you do the one mile run and, you know, um, you can look online at what typical times are, but you, you feel like a superhero by the time you get that done. Well said. Okay, got more. Your favorite guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Uh, Butterfinger Blizzard from Dairy Queen. Pure <laughs> cancer. Pure cancer. But if I was dying right now in a car accident, just shove some of that in my mouth and I'll die with a smile. <laughs> Will you ever indulge in a cocktail or not your thing? Uh, I used to. Um, never really had a a problem quote unquote with it. But I realized while well, about to have my first kid in Singapore that um, I need more energy, not less. So I took a three month break and never missed it. So it's been 13 years since I've had a drink. Good for you. Good for you. Probably better off. Probably. Okay. Uh, your favorite book? Uh, Success Principles by Jack Canfield. Um, I've read it with my kids three times. And uh, Be Useful by Schwarzenegger is my favorite new book that came out. Love Arnold. I saw that you love the book. I read it myself. Nice. Uh, it's funny because I can't get enough. A lot of the yeah. stuff he talks about in that book, you've heard him talk about before. Some new stuff too, 
but just his principles and you, and you can't argue the way his percept the way he sees the world he just thinks so big and then he's able to yeah. break down into a framework which is awesome he's amazing yeah awesome book you should put your thoughts aside unfortunately you're if you don't love him already and read that book and then you'll love him agreed beautifully said okay i know you've been to a lot of places so there's probably i don't know but your favorite or or maybe your dream travel destination uh bali is my favorite place that's why we're living in hawaii and that's why i'm going there in two weeks um you know i wanted u.s healthcare, u.s police u.s education but um if i could be living in bali right now amen okay and last one uh favorite morning ritual essential Morning ritual essential. I read uh, this one pager that has my monthly, quarterly, annual goals, and then it has about fifty different one-line statements on how my I need to operate in the world. And I know if I keep those top of mind and do those things, that everything's going to go great. Okay. Is spirituality important to you? Uh, it is, but I'm not a huge believer in robotically going to church and and doing things in a traditionally super religious, religious way so, uh but but yeah it is but more in like a alignment with nature and and good way amen amen okay okay uh this was unbelievable what's the best way for our communities and, and our audience to support you is there something they can get involved in where can we direct them so one thing i could use help on is that i have you know i got to interview tony robbins because i said this one time on stage and you know, Schwarzenegger, he got laughed at to his face many times when he tried to become an actor, for example. People laughed at his face, right? Giannis became an NBA MVP, and people laughed in his face his first year when he said he was going to be MVP. So I think you're, it's good to notice in life when people laugh at something, and you know that that may be something you need to do more of. And at one of my events, I said, hey, if anybody's friends with, like, Michael Jordan or Taylor Swift, you know, have them answer my questions for billionaires.com. And people literally laughed like, oh, that's ridiculous. But at the last event before that, I said, hey, if anyone's friends with Tony Robbins, let me know. And I got to interview him that same day. And you can see that interview on, on billionaires.com. So that's the request I'd make here. If anyone knows of a billionaire, even better if they're not famous, honestly, because then they don't have a thousand gatekeepers. But we just want them to answer our three critical questions that we're asking 100 billionaires. And we want to make billionaires.com the number one source of scaling strategies, mindsets uh, of billionaires. And we've got 41 of those interviews done already. And if you look at them, I think that um, you'll see the great value in this. And I think it's going to be a, it already is a super unique project. So that's the number one request is just keep us in mind for billionaires.com. Uh, anyone that would answer those interview questions via audio message or email or text message or Zoom, whatever's easy for them. We know they're busy, uh, no video crew required. And then the other thing is just to check out familyoffices.com. Um, so you can check out our events coming up, membership in our investor club, and um, feel free to shoot me an email if anyone has questions, just richard at familyoffices.com. I love it. And I have uh, a few billionaires in my network that I'd love to introduce you to. I'd love for you to do awesome. that. Awesome. That'd be great. Appreciate it. Richard, thank you so much for stopping by today and dropping these priceless, juicy nuggets. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me here, Greg. Appreciate it. Hang out for one sec.